Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future, coming to you for 15 years in January, 2022, from Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and viewers, we're welcoming back our, our special guest, Kevin Kemp's nuclear waste specialist for Beyond Nuclear, a radioactive waste specialist with Beyond Nuclear. Welcome back, Kevin Kemp's. Thank you so much, Margaret. Glad to be here. Yes. So, Kevin, we have a whole a whole lot of things to talk about, and it's uh, as we go into probably the third year of the COVID time, which of course has affected everyone in in many many ways. So uh, I'm going to start, if if I may, with the uh, something specifically to do with Vermont, which was the, the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, and you gave me some news about that. What what is that, Kevin? Well, a hard won victory um, after really many months, but even years of effort. And that was to get the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Decommissioning Citizen Advisory Panel to back off of its advocacy, which began around 2015, promoting consolidated interim storage facilities out West. And it's fair to say that most of the panelists, even in 2015, did not understand or even know that their panel was being represented as in favor of these dump sites out west. But the chairman of the panel back then signed on to an initiative, a letter that Yankee Atomic had concocted to try to get out from under the liability of the high level radioactive waste that it had generated, that it had profited filthily from. And they got this uh, signature from the chairman of the panel onto a letter to the federal government saying, open these dumps out west, we want to send our waste there. So it took years, all told, to get the panel to back off of that advocacy. And at a recent um, meeting of the panel, I learned that that had in fact taken place some months ago. I hadn't heard about the news, so I was very pleased to learn that the panel had finally done the right thing and stopped its advocacy for these environmental injustices, these uh, de facto surface storage parking lot dumps that are targeted as we speak at Texas and New Mexico. And in fact, the Texas dump, which is very closely affiliated with North Star, the firm that is decommissioning Vermont Yankee, unfortunately last September got a license to construct and operate its dump from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So it's quite an outrageous ruling by the NRC. The good news is that a broad coalition beyond nuclear, Sierra Club, um, a coalition of grassroots groups called Don't Waste Michigan and others, that's seven grassroots groups across the country, and even an oil company have all joined together with the state of Texas, ruby red conservative Republican Texas, to fight this decision by the NRC. And we're fighting it in court, but we're fighting it in many other ways as well. Okay, I'm sorry, my, my communication here froze for a bit, a bit. so it, it, it does no harm to repeat, Kevin, if you will, the decision, the NRC, NRC decision. Okay, yeah, um, we've been fighting this dump since we learned of it. And really one place that this dump scheme began was unfortunately, the Obama administration's Blue Ribbon Commission, Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, which in January of 2012 recommended that consolidated interim storage facilities are a good idea for a plan B since the yucca dump in Nevada is not happening. So um, unfortunately the industry and the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission took that recommendation, even though it's not law, it's simply a panel at the Department of Energy that recommended this idea. It's not law by any means. And they have ran with it ever since. We've been fighting it ever since. We sent a letter to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in October of 2016 with our allies on the ground in Texas and New Mexico because it was clear where they were targeting even way back then. And we said, for one thing, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you should not process these applications because they on their face violate the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 as amended. 
Specifically, the violation is that the US Department of Energy cannot take title to, cannot take ownership of commercial or radiated nuclear fuel at an interim site unless there's a permanent repository open in the country. And the reason that that safeguard was put into the law by small states like New Mexico, which has a population of just a couple, three million people, is so that they would not become surface permanent dump sites because interim storage will become permanent if there's no repository to take the waste away to. That's exactly the situation we're in. The NRC disregarded our warning shot across the bow. The companies proceeded with applications and long story short, despite our best efforts in the NRC licensing proceeding in both New Mexico and Texas, two separate companies, we were rejected by the NRC, even to the point of them mostly not recognizing the standing of many of the interveners. You have no legal right to even participate in this proceeding, NRC ruled, which was absurd because one of the groups that they kicked out for lack of standing, or they never recognized the standing of this group is called Alliance for Environmental Strategies, which is the local grassroots environmental justice group in Southeastern New Mexico, right on the border with Texas, they never got recognition of legal standing by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And besides that, they threw out all of their contentions anyway, that they lacked merit. That decision alone by the licensing board, by the NRC staff, by the NRC commissioners who backed it all up on appeal is an environmental justice outrage <laughs> that nobody knows about. But we continue to fight. In fact, one of the founders of Alliance for Environment, sorry, Alliance for Environmental Strategies, AFES, her name is Rose Gardner in Eunice, New Mexico. She has provided legal standing for beyond nuclear in the Texas dump fight. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how the NRC can recognize her standing in one case and not in another, but they did. But we're thankful because Rose okay. has done beyond nuclear standing in the Texas case. And we continue to fight on her behalf as a member of Beyond Nuclear against this Texas licensing. And um, you know, just today, uh, January 20th, was our major deadline for a legal filing. All parties opposed to the Texas dump were to have filed their first major motions and briefings in the Court of Appeals in Washington, DC, the second highest court in the land. The deadline was today. But just last week, the court suspended the deadline. The reason for this at the last second as it happened is because the state of Texas and Faskin Oil have filed appeals in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals against the Texas dump. That's headquartered in New Orleans. That's where Texas goes in its neck of the woods. In addition, the state of New Mexico has filed an appeal at the federal level in its circuit court, which is the Tenth Circuit headquartered in Denver. This has kind of created um, a wrench, a monkey wrench in the works because the courts now have to figure out, are we gonna take three separate appeals in three separate places in the country? Are we going to consolidate them all into a single circuit court of appeals? So it's very interesting that our, our broad and our deep coalition of opposition has for the moment kind of fought it to a standstill but this is really just a temporary stay on the proceedings. The courts will make their decisions and then we will proceed with the, the federal appeals at that point. Okay, thanks, Kevin. And, and bring us back, please, to Vermont uh, VNDCAP uh, rescinding its support for the consolidated interim storage. So what is then the, what is offered in the opposite way. I mean, if they if they rescinded this support for for one thing, what is the other the other that is offered? Yeah, my my understanding is that the um, endicap has no legal authority to set policy or to take policy positions. They are an advisory panel to the state legislature, and you know the state legislature could take policy positions, um, but the endicap should not be doing so. Um, you know, truth be told, uh, the alternative to consolidated interim storage facilities, the alternative to bad siting of permanent dump sites like at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, at least in the interim, is hardened on-site storage for waste that exists. If not on-site, then as near to the point of origin as possible. 
you know, the Connecticut River, uh, where Vermont Yankee is located, has had floods in the not too distant past. So the question has to be asked, is the dry cast storage at Vermont Yankee, which is the current situation, appropriate given this flooding risk? Or should it be moved some distance away from the river, further inland to higher ground to better protect the waste? And in fact, the very um, same owners of Vermont Yankee and Pilgrim, Massachusetts, uh, Entergy Nuclear in the past before um, North Star took over the Vermont Yankee site, before Holtec took over the Pilgrim site, and even further back in time, Yankee Atomic, um, there's so much overlap between these two sites. They both use Holtec containers, for example, to hold the irradiated nuclear fuel once the pools are emptied. Um, at Pilgrim, by contrast, they have moved the dry cast storage further from the ocean shore, further inland to higher ground. They have not done that at the Vermont Yankee site at the Connecticut River. So, um, you know, those are some of the questions that this panel should be looking into. Um, and like I said, not just myself, but others from across the country and certainly local watchdogs have been attending these panel sessions trying to educate the panelists as to the various risks, the various objections to these dump sites out West. So we're just thankful that they've backed off on their very inappropriate advocacy for environmental injustice out West. Right. I, I should mention that North Star is so closely affiliated with the Texas dump. Many of the same companies, they're really the same company. North Star is comprised of waste control specialists, this Texas low level radioactive waste dump that's been taking large amounts of low-level radioactive waste, so-called, not only from Vermont Yankee, but from 36 states. So it's a national low-level radioactive waste dump. That's one of the companies. Another one is Orano, formerly called Areva, formerly called Kojima, this French nuclear giant that has operations in the US. And there are other corporate partners that comprise North Star, but they are the Texas dump. They already dump low level radioactive waste, some of which is highly radioactive. That's the misnomer. Now they want to expand into high level radioactive waste, irradiated nuclear fuel. And uh, that's what we're fighting in Texas. Right, and, and, and Kevin, let's go to Holtec in New Jersey and the corruption that was upheld by New, the New Jersey court. Could you speak to that issue for a few minutes, please? So Holtec um, technically is North Star's competition, but they're actually in cahoots. They're more of a cabal than they are competition. Mm -hmm. So Holtec, based in New Jersey, also based in Florida, uh, they're a big sprawling company with global, global operations at this point, but they came out of New Jersey. They began as a um, container supplier for irradiated nuclear fuel, but they've expanded beyond that now. They now are a decommissioning firm. They decommission Oyster Creek, New Jersey, for example. And what just went down in New Jersey, unfortunately, is a judge has backed up Holtec's corruption and law breaking. What Holtec's CEO, Krishna Singh, did some years ago is he filled out an application for a, ma a massive tax break in New Jersey to the tune of $260 million. And he lied under oath on this form when asked, have you ever been debarred, um, banned from doing business with a state government, a national government? Have you ever? Tell us about it. And he said simply, no, we have not. And that was a false statement under oath. Holtec was barred from doing business for a unfortunately too short period of time with the Tennessee Valley Authority because of a bribery scandal in Alabama at the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant uh, Holtec, and there's evidence that Krishna Singh was directly involved, paid $55,000 in a bribe to a Tennessee Valley Authority official to secure a contract for high-level radioactive waste storage. And um, that official got in trouble, um, was convicted of receiving the bribe, but incredibly enough, uh, Holtec has largely, largely skated, scot-free, the giver of the bribe. In fact, they eventually went on to keep that contract at Browns Ferry. So they were implicated and debarred for a short period of time. They had to pay a $2 million fine having to do with that bribe. But Krishna Singh simply said, no, we have never been debarred. 
was caught by investigative journalists at ProPublica and WNYC radio. And it led to a major investigation and even a lawsuit in New Jersey. Incredibly, a state judge in New Jersey, Superior Court, just ruled that no state of New Jersey, you must pay Holtec this tax break money that you had agreed to. Incredibly, in my opinion, the state judge is now a part of the corruption that Holtec all too often operates under. And yet, despite all this, the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission is all too happy to allow Holtec to take over at Oyster Creek, New Jersey, at Pilgrim, Massachusetts. We're on the brink of final approval of Holtec taking over at two nuclear plants in Michigan, Palisades in the southwest of Michigan, Big Rock Point in the northwest of the Lower Peninsula. This crooked company involved in criminal wrongdoing, including serial bribery, has been put in charge of not only decommissioning retired nuclear power plants, but managing the high level radioactive waste at those sites and is on the brink. Again, this month, the NRC was supposed to, by schedule, have approved outrageously the Holtec dump in New Mexico. But Holtec's um, paperwork is so half baked. Its responses to NRC staff requests for additional information have been so bad that even the NRC has had to delay final approval of the New Mexico dump. So that has bought us some months of additional time to resist the New Mexico dump, thankfully. But incredibly, you know, um, Holtec largely gets away with all of this wrongdoing nationwide right. thus far. And, and Kevin, you you answered my uh, my question when I we were preparing for the show that the main issue in 2022 is you're fighting through beyond nuclear the high level radioactive waste dumps targeted at New Mexico and Texas. So this is your main focus for 2022, correct? Yes, and it's going to intensify big time. Um, right. Like I said, this this stay on the court proceedings is temporary, and once it's off to the races, the deadlines will come fast and furious, but we're prepared to meet them. We have some of the best legal counsel in the country on our side, and uh, we have tremendous support in the states of Texas and New Mexico. So there's this you know, lie called consent-based citing, and both Holtec and Interim Storage Partners claim that they have consent in these places. Well, they sure don't. <laughs> Andrews County, Texas has taken the position against the dump targeted at it, which is a major reversal. They were enamored with the money they were making on low level radioactive waste disposal. While they've gotten the message on high level and they're no longer into it. But also the state of Texas passed a law shortly before NRC rubber stamped the dump that disallowed the dump by state law in Texas. In fact, the state of Texas is preventing its own agencies from providing permits needed for the dump to go forward. And the same is true in New Mexico. So um, I should mention that that Texas dump is a whopping 0 0.37 miles from the New Mexico state line. That's why New Mexico is so concerned about the Texas dump. Both states oppose both dumps because they really hover on either side of the state line separating the two states. So. Mm -hmm. um, we have tremendous grassroots and even state government support in our opposition to these dumps. Right. And uh, Kevin, let, let's put it into the context of the, the permanent dump that uh, Senator Harry Reid uh, resisted throughout his, his tenure in the, in the U.S. Senate. Can you speak to that issue at the moment? Senator Reid has passed. Yeah. And I remember meeting with you in his offices in in, uh, in Washington with the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability. I believe at that time uh, he couldn't show up for the meeting with us, but uh, I think that you, later you did meet with him. So could you just talk about that for a few minutes? Well, um, Harry Reid uh, was a US Senator, a Democrat from Nevada who went on from very humble origins to become the Democratic leader of the US Senate. And <clears throat> when the Screw Nevada Bill was passed in 1987, singling out Nevada at Yucca Mountain as the radioactive waste dump for the country, 
the powers that be in the nuclear power industry and the nuclear weapons industry, their friends in Congress and the executive branch messed with the wrong rookie senator, a former amateur boxer, a former Capitol police officer. Reed devoted the rest of his illustrious career to fighting the Yucca Mountain dump and winning. He succeeded. It was a huge David versus Goliath struggle. But Harry Reid had a lot of help. He had the help of the Western Shoshone Indian Nation, whose land Yucca Mountain is by treaty right. He had a thousand plus environmental groups across the country, and we stopped it, sometimes by the skin of our teeth, um, but we did. So why, why this is all relevant right now, I should mention that President Biden was one of the speakers at Harry Reid's funeral in Las Vegas and listed the Yucca Mountain victory as one of Reed's great accomplishments of his career, which, you know, the Obama and Biden administration um, both times recognized that Yucca Mountain, they say, is not workable, which is a euphemism for the people of Nevada. In fact, the environmental movement of the country and the Western Shoshone will not let this happen. It's not workable. So at least Obama and Biden got that <laughs> and still do. Um, so why it's relevant still is that these consolidated interim storage facilities, they use that word interim. How can they get away with saying that when there's no permanent dump site? They assume that Yucca will someday open. Incredibly, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is complicit in that assumption. They've licensed the Texas dump already. They're about to license the New Mexico dump based on this false assumption that Yucca will open someday. It's not going to open. What's really incredible about the NRC doing that is they are supposed to be the objective, neutral, unbiased judge in the Yucca Mountain licensing proceeding, which has not even yet begun. Obviously, they've already ruled in favor of the dump opening, but that's to be expected of the NRC. If you know anything about the NRC, it is that it is a rubber stamp agency that gives the industry everything it wants. It may go through the motions, it may take some time to do so, but it does so, no matter the merits of the case whatsoever. It's raw politics, it's raw giveaway to the nuclear industry. So Harry Reid fought that tooth and nail for decades at Yucca Mountain. In fact, a little known thing about Harry Reid is that he had a huge hand in stopping a consolidated interim storage facility in Utah at the Skull Valley Goshutes Indian Reservation that would have brought the waste that close to Yucca Mountain, Nevada. And then the, the inertia, the momentum from bringing it that close to Yucca Mountain probably would have put the Yucca dump over the top. And he helped stop that. Okay, I'm sorry that, that uh, sometimes the uh, this freezes, my, my, my screen freezes and I lose some of the words here, but, but uh, I'm sure that they'll be on, they'll be on our program. So, uh, Let's, you just got off the doomsday clock announcement. So please, would you tell us what that is and uh, what, what uh, you learned in that amount of time? The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists started the doomsday clock in 1947. And for a long time, they kept track of the nuclear weapons danger, the danger of nuclear war. In more recent years, they've added things like the climate crisis and now the pandemic to their global review. And I attended um, before this interview, they just announced what the current clock is set at and it is 100 seconds to midnight, which is where it's been since 2020, which is the closest that the clock has ever been to midnight, which is the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists saying we are in much more danger of things like nuclear war, and climate chaos and global pandemic than we've ever been in since 1947. So, you know, there were some other close calls back in the 1950s during the Cold War when the US and Soviet Union were really rattling their sabers, but the clock has never been set closer than it is now. And I'm not even sure, you know, they've kept it at the same place for 2020, 2021, now 2022. When I heard them do that just now, I couldn't help but ask, but did you recognize, acknowledge, account for the fact that there are more than 100,000 Russian troops on the border of Ukraine? And as President Biden said just yesterday in his news conference, when wars start, 
there's no telling what's going to happen. So you have a nuclear armed power, the Russian government, about to invade a country that used to have nuclear weapons when it was part of the Soviet Union, Ukraine, but to its credit, gave them up. They returned to the Soviet Union, now Russia. But of course, Ukraine has allies like the United States and France and the UK who have nuclear weapons themselves as members of NATO, which NATO effectively is the nuclear umbrella protecting 30 countries, unfortunately, with this false notion of nuclear deterrence. So um, it's a very dicey situation. I'm not sure the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists accounted for that little detail of the present moment that we're on the brink of war between Russia and Ukraine. Kevin, just for a moment, could you talk about, I, I know that you've told us before in your wonderful many visits with, uh, with this program about your starting out with Beyond Nuclear. Were you there at the beginning of Beyond Nuclear when it was founded? And uh, when did Beyond Nuclear uh, I, I won't say switch the focus to nuclear power, but when did it give it full balance with nuclear weapons? So Beyond Nuclear was founded in 2007, and I was right there at the founding. Um, we sort of stepped into the shoes of Helen Caldicott, her organization, Nuclear Policy Research Institute. We took on the 501c3 status, uh, changed the name, Helen is still recognized as our founding president. And um, granted, NPRI was focused on both, and we are too. I would say that we, as, as much as we try to address nuclear weapons, our real focus is nuclear power. But there's that issue that nuclear power leads to nuclear weapons, the, the proliferation risk of nuclear power. In fact, um, don't take it from me, take it from Ernest Moniz and MIT nuclear engineering professor who served as President Obama's energy secretary, who several years ago said, we need nuclear power so that we can maintain our nuclear weapons arsenal. They used to deny that. They used to claim there was a separation, but now we know there's not. And really, truth be told, there never has been. Okay. So that, uh, that really, uh, I, I know that you were, you have been active in the nuclear, the anti-nuclear movement uh, from from your very youngest days, and you you have shared with us on this program your initiation into this world. So, what is the uh, the role of money in this world? I mean, it it seems to be the bottom line and the top line in, in observing what is going on. Like here in Vermont, uh, the uh, the issue, as you have addressed it with us on, on this program, is the transport of uh, of irradiated uh, fuel to the uh, to the places in in the West, and uh, money money and uh, government money, which is taxpayers' money, seems to play the major role in it. Do you agree? Yes. Follow the money. Um... The nuclear power industry, certainly the nuclear weapons industry, have been the recipients of literally trillions of dollars. I mean, there was the atomic audit written in 1996 by a number of authors, and the figure that they calculated was that $7.5 trillion had been spent in the United States on the nuclear weapons arsenal since 1942. $7.5 trillion. And as we speak, um, I mean, the nuclear power industry has been the recipient of hundreds of billions of dollars in public subsidies over the decades. But as we speak, um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed contains $9 billion for nuclear power, $6 billion for bailing out old reactors that are dangerously age degraded, another $3 billion for proposed new reactor designs. That's already on the books. That's U.S. taxpayer money. As we speak, the Build Back Better Act, the US House passed version, contains up to $35 billion in old reactor bailouts. It has not passed the Senate yet, but there is talk of breaking up the bill into smaller pieces. The climate pieces in which the nuclear part is included is a likely front runner. So we'll see. Uh, Joe Manchin, the infamous so-called Democrat from West Virginia, is very pro-nuclear power. He says he's big on nuclear, 
He's the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. So he's received large campaign contributions from the nuclear power industry and away we go. Um, these bailouts are particularly dangerous to safety because they would prop up reactors that in some cases are now 50 plus years old. And for example, um, Entergy at Palisades, Michigan has said they will close that 50 plus year old reactor by May 31st of this year. They've lied about that in the past. I don't think they're lying this time because Holtak is so eager to take over the site for decommissioning. Holtak currently anyway is not operating reactors, although they do have a small modular nuclear reactor division. They would like to build new reactors and operate them perhaps. They uh, have pulled a bait and switch at Oyster Creek, New Jersey, where they're supposed to be dismantling a retired atomic reactor, but they've floated the trial balloon of, hey, what if we build a small modular reactor here? So again, Holtec cannot be trusted at all. But anyway, I, I fear that with that much money being thrown around, a lot of reactors that would otherwise shut, perhaps even including Palisades, that is on the brink of closure, might be resurrected like zombies and keep going, which is so very dangerous because they are at the breaking point in terms of many of their systems, structures, and components that could lead to a meltdown. Okay. Well, on the note, on that note, uh, let's end, if you if you agree, with the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and bring us up to date on that, please. Well, J January twenty second of twenty twenty two will mark the first anniversary of the entry into force of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, a year ago, uh, the 50th country in the world ratified the treaty, making it binding international law, at least on those who have signed and ratified it, which is a very large number of countries at this point, but does not include any of the nuclear weapons powers, or as I mentioned earlier, NATO, any of the countries that enjoy so-called nuclear umbrella protection. So we still have a long way to go, but this treaty is so inspirational and so um, hopeful. So folks are recognizing this anniversary with banner hangs and vigils and film showings to try to raise awareness that nuclear weapons are illegal internationally, making the United States a rogue country at this point. Okay, on that note, <laughs> I mean, uh, making the United States a rogue country uh, that's very heavy. Well, don't take it from me, take it from Henry Kissinger, who I don't often quote or agree with on many things, but he said more than a decade ago, the United States has few existential threats. And one of them, the lead one, is nuclear weapons held by our enemies and our adversaries, which would include terrorists at this point, if they were to ever get a hold of nuclear weapons. And so, Joining with other former secretaries of state and secretaries of defense, Henry Kissinger, who built his entire political career on nuclear brinksmanship, said, we need to abolish nuclear weapons. Echoing President Kennedy, who said, we need to abolish nuclear weapons before they abolish us. So don't take it from me, take it from Henry Kissinger. It's about time that the United States do what's right and wise in its own self-interest. Mm. Thank you, Kevin Camps, again, for your, your, your wonderful eye-opening uh, elucidation of what is going on in this time. And thank you for all of the work that you do. And please come back and join us again and, and, uh, and bring me some uh, ideas for programs as we go forward into 2022. And uh, best to all of your colleagues there, including uh, not a beyond nuclear uh, person, I don't believe for say, but uh, Alfred uh, Meyer, who you yes. have appeared on this program with, and we hope that he will return to us also. Yeah, Thank he you worked with um, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Yes. Thank you so much, Kevin Camps. Till next time. Thank Take you very care. much, Margaret. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.